Lisa, welcome to the Connected Families podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just delighted to be here. Yeah, we are, uh, Lynn and I, together hosting this episode today uh, and so delighted to cross paths with a real person from Empowered to Connect <laughs> after, after so many years of gleaning from the many different teachings of Dr. Purvis. And, and now here we are with Lisa, the co-author of a book ca called The Connected Parent that you co-authored with Dr. Purvis. And um, before we go too much into what the book says and what the exciting things are that we're gonna talk about to help equip parents today, I'd love you to talk a little bit about the story of how this became a book. This is a very unique, special story, isn't it? It really is. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing thing that God did to bring this book actually to fruition. I, there were many, many times along the way that I did not know if it would happen. And, and we're just thrilled that it did. When it actually, when I actually held it in my hands, I just nearly cried because I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so talk a little bit about the story, your story, your family's story that led you to this place of co-authoring a book with Dr. Karen Purvis. Well, when we had eight children by birth, we had a busy, busy life. I was homeschooling. Um, my, yeah, our, our oldest. I'm were, already eager to hear how the yeah. story goes. <laughs> well, our I'm oldest, already impressed. <laughs> yeah, they were in college and my youngest was three. And I remember having a deep sense that God was going to do something different in our lives, that something was going to happen. I actually thought I was going to be going back to graduate school or something along those lines. And then some friends called to tell us that they were adopting two children from Ethiopia. And that call I see as a turning point in our lives mm. where God just opened our hearts. So eight was definitely not enough for you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure, but I just <laughs> felt like God had something new and you know, I was already home full time with my children. We were very focused on raising a family. And I thought, we have something really beautiful here. And we could share this with children who need a family. So that began this journey toward adoption. And we originally planned to adopt two little boys. And they were younger than our youngest daughter. And but we had been sponsoring a little girl from an orphanage with children who were living with HIV. And when our friends went to Ethiopia to get their children, they visited this little girl and the staff at her orphanage said that they were hoping that we were going to adopt her. Well, we had no idea that was even a possibility. We really knew very, very little about HIV. We didn't know that she was even available to be adopted. Mm -hmm. And when our friends returned to the U.S. and told us this, we went through a deep process of prayer and of God really breaking our hearts for her in a pretty profound way. And we felt that God compelled us to adopt her. And so we added her to the adoption process. Wow. So we adopted three unrelated children through two different agencies simultaneously, which is pretty much unheard of and pretty crazy, really. <laughs> and then we went, when we traveled to Ethiopia, we met another little girl and returned a year later for her. So that's how all of these children joined our family. Wow. Yeah. Well, we hear a lot of stories about families formed through adoption, and I'm not sure we've, and we often will say, gosh, we've heard pretty much all the things, but this is... <laughs> that, that one was unique. So um, you adopted these children, you brought them home, you figured we're going to make a difference in the lives of these three youngsters, we're going to do what we've known how to do. Um, how did that go for you, and, and what did you do... Uh, I give away a little bit of the story when it didn't go quite the way you might imagine it would. Well, you know, I think we thought we were well prepared. We had been parents for 20 years. We read books in preparation. I had even worked in mental health, young, out of college. And I, we knew it was going to be hard. I mean, let's just think about this. These are children who've been in mm -hmm. orphanages. These are children who've experienced horrible, horrible traumatic events and so, of course, we didn't expect it to be easy. We didn't go into it thinking love is enough. We knew it was going to be hard work. We knew mm -hmm. that. I think what we didn't anticipate was both the depth of one of our daughters 
behaviors and challenges and the degree that she had been impacted by trauma. And secondly, I don't think we could have ever anticipated the duration. You know, it wasn't like, well, in one year or in two years, things will be much easier, much better. Truly with children with a lot of trauma, this is a lifelong journey. Right. You know, these things, you know, children can heal, families heal, but it's a long journey. And yeah. we definitely experienced that as a family. So I'm imagining there were some dark days, maybe even some, I wonder if we can, <laughs> I wonder if there's a plan B here sorts of days. There were some Did very dark those? Oh, very dark, desperate days. You know, I had believed that I was a good mom. I really felt like, wow, I'm pretty good at this. And I love this. Yes, it was super hard. I mean, I had a lot of kids and there were lots of days that were hard. But overall, I just, I had a sense of myself as a good mom. And honestly, that was pretty shredded away in those mm -hmm. early years <laughs> that our kids were home when I felt like, maybe I'm not even who I thought I was. So it was, there was a deep interpersonal kind of thing happening in me in addition to everything that was happening in our family because one of our daughter's behaviors were very extreme. And our family that had been really, you know, busy and noisy and, but close, just felt like we were plunged into chaos. We mm -hmm. really, really were. And it was deeply painful and it, truly, it was very frightening for us because we felt like the foundation we built our family on was just crumbling underneath us, and we knew that we needed help. It took us a little while because we thought, again, I was pretty optimistic, yeah. but once we realized how deep into this we were and how difficult every day was, we knew we needed help. So your foundation is crumbling, and you don't know what to do, where to turn. If you're like a lot of the parents that we've talked to, you turn to some some standard sorts of things and you read them and they're like, they just don't get us, right? Right. So tell us about how that connection was made between you and the organization you now serve. Well, I don't officially work for Empowered to Connect at all. I have wrote with them and spoke with them for a period of time, but... The folks at Empowered to Connect, you know, it was originally founded by Dr. Karen Purvis and Michael and Amy Monroe, mm -hmm. and they were, I connected with them in the early years, and eventually, through speaking with Empowered to Connect, I was able to give her my idea for this book, and my idea, and what, what I had experienced was that there were so many wonderful professionals, including our therapist, who was incredible, we had read all the books, but there wasn't anybody who was living my life, mm -hmm. who was every day trying yeah. to get out of bed and do this one more time, you know, who had times where I was so afraid for our future. And so I went to Dr. Purvis and I said, what would you think of writing a book that combined all of this incredible yeah. knowledge that you have and your wisdom with my real life, yeah. my everyday doing this and trying to learn it, trying to learn these methods and these tools and use them in my family. And thankfully she thought it was a great idea. So the book was born way back in 2012. And yes. I couldn't help but think as I kept read, as I read through the book, uh, I kept thinking, my goodness, this is what people have been asking for as it relates to, to, um, the connected child because the connected child we hear and the teaching we hear has been in many respects so powerful but but lacking in the very practical application and what your stories do is put the rubber to the road of application of of this framework that is so powerful now i want to pause for just a minute because uh I think it's become obvious even in the context of this interview that there's a lot of synergy between what you do and what our organization does. And listeners are going to recognize concepts and ideas and the way that we talk about parenting so similarly. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we've got this little framework. I don't know how familiar you are with it, Lisa, but everything we do runs through this refrigerator magnet. We even affectionately will frequently say um, the magnet says it all. And it's just a little refrigerator magnet with a little pyramid that starts with a foundation and then connect and then coach and then correct and then some little verbiage and Bible verses to back all of that up. How familiar have you become with the framework and what would you have to say to our listeners about the efficacy, the ideas behind, behind the framework? 
Well, I have had an opportunity to look at your framework. And when I looked at it, I thought, wow, we have a lot in common <laughs> because it is so similar. You know, I think maybe, and I was, I'm not sure about this, but I think your foundation is maybe a little different from ours because we're not assuming attachment. We're assuming trauma with mm -hmm. this, the empowered to connect framework. Yep. So we start from a place of with our people knowing that their children have experienced trauma. And so they're not necessarily going to have attachment with the parent. Um, but we go, so then we go from the bottom, we empower the child and that's meeting the needs of their body, um, food, hydration, sensory input and sensory needs met. So we start with empowering the child to give them the best opportunity. And then we go to connection where the relationship is the center of every interaction. You know, we always want to keep that connection with the child. And yeah. then lastly, we go to correction, just like you. You know, all of these things have to come before we yep. get to correction. And then when we correct, you know, we're really trying to look at the need beneath the behavior. Yeah. You know, we're trying to get to those needs and not just do a surface correction. And, sure. you know, children, especially children who are not neurotypical or children who have experienced adversity, that, you know, things like uh, consequences may not really work. You know, some of these kids can't think in that way. Um, they also may not be able to receive a lot of words. And I, I don't know about you, but parents, including <laughs> us, tend to use way too many words with children, yeah. you know? So we have to really be mindful of the child when we move into that correction mode. Yeah, I just read the book, honey. I've learned a whole bunch of things that I need you to know. And so I'm going to tell them all to you right now before bed while you're having a, a, a very difficult time managing your feelings and have yes. thrown something <laughs> at the wall. So sit right. down and listen. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, not very effective. Well, no. and, and um, I, I do want to uh, just add a little, um, texture to this idea of the foundation as we talk about it. because you spoke right at the outset when you said the foundations of our of our past and our understanding were crumbling um, we totally agree the foundation is where this needs to start which is really an inner work that the parents need to do before we start making assumptions about what relationship with our children is is going to look like and I've noticed that um, in, in um, Dr. Purvis's work, she kind of has that layer in there, but it's really about helping a parent look at their attachment style, whereas the parents that come to us are not familiar with that language. And we really boil that down to just some simple thought-provoking questions for them, like what's going on in me? What am I believing about myself? Mm -hmm. What am I believing about my child? What's God's grace and truth for us? So there's, there's big overlap um, and we don't assume that every parent coming to, to be a parent has a healthy background, has had healthy modeling. Um, and so we don't start with the tools, but we start with that foundation piece. And I think you folks do as well, but yeah. you approach it more from the, the attachment style paradigm. Yep. Right. That, that's a really good point. I think, you know, when I first started hearing about, um, you know, parents examining their own attachment style, to be honest, it took me straight to shame. I was like, I am barely hanging by a thread as a parent. And now you're telling me, this is how I heard it. Now you're telling me that maybe it's actually my fault. And I was so overwhelmed and felt kind of judged. And it took me a while to understand that there is no failure in attachment, you know, like in, in terms of personal failure, it's not, we, we come as who we are. We come with our histories. We come with the parents we had who for the most part were doing the very best they could. And now we have this opportunity to reflect mm -hmm. and to figure out what is it when my child does this, what is it about that that really bothers yeah. me? Mm -hmm. And how can I process that so that I am not triggered, you know, into fear? I tend to go to fear more than anything else. Some people go to other emotions, but I go to fear. And once I understood sort of the power of it and the purpose of it, then I was able to learn, you know, yeah. something, something new about my own attachment and what I was bringing to the relationships with my children. Right. When parents see, wow, this has the potential to get me really unstuck. 
then they're more willing to look at that mm -hmm. than if we just go, oh, wait a minute, I know you want to focus on your child's behavior, but we're going to talk about you and what's going on in you. Right, <laughs> right. And that's, that has to be done, I think, so sensitively, you yep. know? And I, when we wrote that chapter, when I wrote that in the book, I just so, I wanted parents to feel understood and not... Yeah. Uh, that they had one more problem in themselves that they had to take care of, but just that we can, we can be, you know, we talk about being curious about our children. Well, we need to be curious about ourselves too. And about our spouses, you know, why does my husband react in that way? Maybe what, what's going on inside of him, you yeah. know? So yeah. there's so much we can learn, like attachment yeah. and marriage, all of it. Attachments, right. kind of everything for yeah. us. Yeah. And there's that thread of the foundation, you know, mm -hmm. which for us is, is it really begins with a question. What's happening in me? What's the belief system that I'm bringing to this? Is it constructive to believe that? Is it not? Is it lined up with God's truth? Is it not? Uh, mm -hmm. Are the assumptions I'm making about the world I'm in helpful or not? Or is, are they as helpful as they could be? Are there others? And it's all this inner work. And throughout the pages of, of this book, The Connected Parents, you call parents to, to, to that place of, yeah, but wait a minute, what's, what's happening with you and how are you taking care of you and mm -hmm. what's your attachment style and how might that be affecting things and what are your expectations and are those realistic or not, uh, especially in light of, of what it was like to be your child before they came into your home. So it's, it's such beautiful stuff. And we mm -hmm. could probably talk for the rest of our time just about this <laughs> important foundational work that, 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 that's needed um, if parents are going to deal wisely uh, uh, and attend well to the different challenges they have with their kids. But I do want to get practical and, and enter into the pages of this, this beautiful piece you've written. And I really love the sort of counter, um, it's almost like the, the, what do you call that, uh, counterpoint? Yeah, the counterpoint in a piece of music where you do your part, mm -hmm. then Dr. Purvis does her part and you do your part. And I know this book sat sort of dormant for a while after Dr. Purvis passed away and you went through some family challenges as well, but the, the, the family and the organization, you know, really compelled you to press on. That piece was nearly done, but it was just so amazing. It was, I could hear Dr. Purvis's voice mm. and then I could hear your, your like, yeah. And let me tell you a story about that. Okay. And practical all the way through. It's so beautiful. Um, I want to land for a little bit on the very practical thing um, about, about simplifying with scripts that you talk about. Like life gets crazy. Things get haywire. We get into habits and patterns that aren't helpful. We talk too much. Our kids listen very little. Um, and then there are scripts that you talk about. <clears throat> uh, 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 simplifying scripts that help parents and again, from our perspective, it helps parents really gather their own wits and, and foundation and go back to the, what they really have determined they want to believe and the parent they want to be. But then they give voice to things in simple sorts of ways that, that their, their kids can understand. Can you talk about, A, just this idea of scripts and how you experience them? And then B, talk a little bit about um, some of your favorites, some of your favorite scripts. The reason I put scripts as the very first strategy is because when parents are struggling and they're exhausted, they need something simple to grab onto. You know, they, we know that when our brains are fatigued, we can only learn so much. And so I wanted parents to have a very simple tool that they could implement that very day without really any preparation. And scripts had been so helpful to me because when our children are behaving, we find our brains thinking, I mean, literally as a parent, what should I do? What should I say? What should I do? You know, and when we have a script, we can use it very quickly. So scripts are just very short phrases that we use to help move our child toward optimal behaviors and beliefs, you know, to change what's happening. And they become familiar to the child. So the child knows what we're expecting. Okay. You know, they, a lot of times, you know, our children have, especially children from trauma, have a lot of fear. And we want to bring them into calm regulation. We want to disarm their fear. And scripts help with that. Because when we say a script, they begin, it becomes common language 
for the family. And so they know what we're communicating. They know what we expect. The other great thing about scripts is that children can only process so many words. And as parents, <laughs> we are inclined, some of us, like me, are inclined to talk way too much. And if a child is at all dysregulated, upset, their ability to process words is even more diminished. They yeah. really cannot hear this barrage of words. So when we use a script, we're keeping it very simple for ourselves and very simple for them. So let me give you an example of a simple script. It would be maybe to say to your child, maybe they're getting a little wound up, they're getting a little rough with the family dog or with a sibling, and we just say, gentle and kind, gentle and kind. And we use this, we say the same thing every single time, you know, gentle and kind. And they know what that means. They know, oh, oh, mom's reminding me to be gentle and kind. And how do they know? Because you practice. So you want to introduce scripts, not in the chaos. You want to introduce <laughs> it in a, in a calm environment. So maybe you would say, we're going to learn something new today. When we play with baby brother, we're going to be gentle and kind. And we, and we repeat it over and mm -hmm. over. Or when you're, when you're playing with the dog, when you're petting the dog, we're not going to be, we're not going to pull on the doggy's ears. We're going to be gentle and kind. And we say it in a really calm voice, you know, in a very, you know, this one we say in a calm voice, some we say in a very lighthearted voice, you know, in a very uh, more playful way. So we can yeah. use scripts in a playful way. So with an older child, I have a child who can be just a little bit demanding. And so I might just in a lighthearted way say to him, so are you asking or telling? And he might pause and say, mm, well, I guess I was telling. And then he'll, yeah. he'll ask it again. So it prompts, a, it prompts a redo, which is another whole thing, you know, but it gives him a chance to try it again. And I say it in a light way. You know, if I say it in a punitive way it's it's useless you yeah. know because mm -hmm. then it takes him in a different direction it brings up the walls but if i say it in a light way it gives him a chance to say to think for a minute and say oh okay i'll say it again you know so that's one that i like with with my older kids um another we use is we want to try to get eye contact with our kids i mean if there's anything i've learned you cannot be washing the dishes and yell over your shoulder to your child you know, we have to get in front of our children. We have to try to get their eyes and looking at ours and before we communicate something. So something that we need them to actually hear. So Dr. Purvis would say it in the most beautiful way, but she would say, let me see your beautiful eyes. And then when the child would look at her, she'd say, oh, your eyes are so beautiful. And then she would give the instruction, whatever yeah. it was, which was so, and she, she did it in a beautiful way. Another way I get eye contact is I will actually tap between my eyebrows and say, look right here. And they can't help but look to see what, where does mom want me to look? Look right here. And then I have their eye contact and I say, oh, great. They're your eyes, you know, and then I'll say something. Yeah. So just simple, really small, simple things. Um, probably the one I use the most with a lot of teenagers is try that again with respect. I say that a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> so know? I do have a question about that. What, what, do you, how do you respond when they go, well, I don't want to do that? You mean actually try it again, say it again? Yeah. Like you say, try it again with respect. And they're, well, they're starting to escalate and they go, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Well, I would probably try to stay in a playful mode for a little bit and say, well, I totally get that. But you know what? The way you just asked me, I can't actually give you an answer. So would you like to try it again with respect? If they're like, no, then I would probably just say, well, let's try again in a little bit. Come back and tell me when you're ready. Perfect. Yeah. You know, perfect. I mean, I think if we, if we go head to head, we're yeah. just going to push it up. It's going to get bigger and bigger. And you know what? We all do that. We all make mistakes. We all take things in the wrong direction sometimes, but simple scripts, I think can help us keep the calm, you know, and keep yeah. our kids' brains engaged with us. We all stay more regulated. It's good. Yeah, it seems to me as if uh, if I'm a parent and I'm prone and I am a parent and I was and even <laughs> still am prone to get quickly angry, <laughs> that that focusing on a script that I've learned that I want to say can help be a part of the calming process for me as well. Um, because if I just deliver that script, look, get, look at my eyes right now. Look at my eyes. Like mm -hmm. what child is going to look at my eyes with that sort of tone? Because they know that even if it's the script that I've been talking about or that we've practiced, Dad is not safe right now. 
Right. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk an awful lot about um, as parents, when we build a strong foundation of faith, of grace for self, of receiving from God what God has for us so that we can pour it out to others, um, that we become safe people. But it's, we can't just we can't just spew out a script and automatically become safe. It's safety is a matter of heart, not a matter of words. I hear you talking about delivering those words with a calmness of heart, with a calmness of spirit that's genuine. Um, what are some ideas or some ways in which you have learned you can get to that place? Even when a, when a child looks you back in the eye, they look at you in the eye and say, you know, swear at you. You don't even have a clue what it's like to be me. And how dare you talk to me that way? Why would I ever want to respect you? And you stay in that. How do you do it? <laughs> how do you prepare to get there? Well, I think the most important thing that has helped me is knowing that I have to be calm and regulated in order to bring my child into calm and regulation. So if I am spinning up and I'm getting agitated, if I'm letting my fear drive me, if I'm starting to look angry, there is no way my child is going to come into a calm, regulated state. Yeah. They're going to, we're going to go up together, you know? So I try. And, and for me, like I said, I tend to go to fear when things start going badly. You know, my brain can go in a second to, oh my goodness, if this is happening when he's 11, when he's 15, he's going to get kicked out of school. He's probably going to end up in jail. Like my brain can go so <laughs> fast in the wrong direction. Yeah. So I have to stay and I will do things physically to calm myself, take a deep breath you know, step back a little bit. Sometimes I'll take a break. You know what? I need to just step out of the room. If things are getting mm -hmm. too heated, go in the laundry room, get on my knees and pray, whatever it is. But I know that I have to stay calm before I can interact. Yeah, that really reminds me of any effectiveness. That reminds me of a story you told in the book. I don't remember what chapter it was in about, about hiding in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, before we before we close this segment and we're, we're this is a rich conversation and we're going to move on in our next segment to get into some more depth and practical things but tell that story about how, because i think this work is so important the work of getting our hearts before the lord even before we go to our kids like how do we in the heat of 11 children coming and going and craziness and mayhem and all these how do we do it Sometimes we have to escape to the bathroom. I'm, I'm guessing you've written a blog post about that. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. I definitely have. There are three places I escape. One is the bathroom, one is the back porch, and one is the laundry room. So if I feel like, <laughs> if I feel like I'm actually beginning to be part of the problem, uh, that's the time to step back and say, And you is know the what? location relative to the amount of angst you have? Just curious. I, I think it's whichever is in closest proximity. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. weather. I do, live in North Idaho. Yeah, yeah. I do live in North Idaho, so the back porch does not always work in All the depth right. of winter. But I will say stepping out into nature and even taking a deep, cold breath of air can really help my brain come back into a more regulated state. Mm. So wherever I need to go, if I... If I get to a point where I am actually making my child more stressed, creating more division between us, I will just say, you know, I, I need to step away for a minute. I love you. I'm going to be right here, but I need to calm myself down. And hopefully what I'm doing is modeling that for yeah, them right. too. That it's okay for them to step back and calm down too. Um, but yeah, I will, I tell a story, I think in the book about these two moms who would call each other inside their closets. Like this one mom would take her phone and go in her closet and call her friend. And she said, we had so many conversations, both sitting in our closets, you know, <laughs> talking to each other because we need, uh, we need to calm ourselves before yeah. we can really help our kids. Well, and it seems like in those calming places, there's, there's maybe even scripts that you've written for yourself to remind yourself of the deep truths that you're living by. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, mantra is a little bit of an Eastern word, but I do have these, these things I tell myself, these, these mantras, these scriptures like, um, my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. You know, I'm not alone here mm -hmm. because my helper made this whole earth, this whole heaven, like he's got this, he's got me, or Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I remember so clearly one night just crying and holding Russ's hand in the night and just saying that over and over, you know, like he is our rock. We are going to be okay because in all this chaos, he is yeah. always the same. So yeah, 
things like that. Well, it's so, oh, it's wonderful. so wonderful, so beautiful. And so again, in alignment with the things that, that we're doing our best to help parents to learn mm-hmm. about, about being recipients of God's grace and truth for you as you seek to dispense it to your children. And uh, you know, what a great um, inspiration Lisa it is to hear your story and get some flesh on the bones examples about, about how that's, uh, how how you do that, but then how that converts into meaningful action. And I hope the parents who are listening uh, this far in have gotten some very practical things that you can take with you just relative to um, understanding, attachment, uh, looking into your own heart, uh, and and then starting to create scripts, both for yourself and for your children, that, that bring you to this place you want to be. Yes, absolutely. And so uh, we're going to come back next time, dive more into really just kind of the outline of, of the book and then whatever tangents it ends up taking us on a little bit. <laughs> I'll be sure to do some of those. <laughs> but uh, Lisa, what a joy to have you along for this little ride. And we look forward to the next session with you. Well, thank you so much.